Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the third edition of Power of Skills Career Summit Transformation. My name is Diana Viola. I'm the Communications Associate at Career Advising and Transition Services at McGill School of Continuing Studies. I would like to introduce to my colleague Zita Maharaj. Uh, she is a career advisor at, at CATS. Say hi. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're listening or tuning in from. Hello, everybody. Welcome. She will co-moderate this session with our Director of Strategic Communications at McGill School of Continuing Studies, Dina Guralnik. Say hi. <laughs> Thank you, Dina. And before we get started and in introducing our speakers, panelists of the day, we would like to share a message with you. McGill University is on land, which has long served as a, as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples. We respect their territory and we will start this session with a, a land acknowledgement. So we will appreciate if you uh, keep your, Microsoft, uh, your microphone closed while we play this video. Thank you very much, Diana. Once again, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to first introduce you to Dina. She is the communications um, director for the School of Continuing Studies. Um, and it is a pleasure to have her come to us. Um, on her um, LinkedIn, it says that she's into communications branding. She's a social media and public relations expert. So first and foremost, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Go ahead. So we would just ask for everybody to kindly um, mute themselves for the duration of the session and um, feel free to type your questions in the chat and or we'll be able to have a question answer period where you yourself will be able to ask those questions later on. So feel free. Dina, all for you. Thank you very much, Zita. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you today and talk about the art of crisis communication. I'm really looking forward to hearing from our expert panelists. Uh, we have uh, three experts with us today and we will introduce them as we go. Uh, but just to say hi, uh, we have uh, Andre, we have Lucia and we have Francois Olivier and uh, we will present them, like I said, a bit later. So crisis communications. Um, I think we've all heard a lot about crisis in the last 18 months. Uh, of course, with, the, with COVID, the biggest global crisis we have all lived through, but the world has also seen a lot of other very significant crises in the last 18 months. Um, like if we think about hunger in Africa, explosion in Beirut, Lebanon, hurricanes Ita and Yota, Rohingya refugee crisis, uh, civil war in Syria, civil war in Yemen, crisis in public health, recession, racial tensions, Me Too movement, and the list goes on and on. So how have these 18 months of crisis, one after another, one worse than the other, involving us personally, emotionally, physically, how has this affected crisis communications? What is most important? Is it the speed of communication? Is it the clarity, the transparency, integrity? What is it? What do you choose when the clock is ticking? These are the kinds of questions that we're gonna to want to answer today. And so we proceed with, uh, without further ado uh, to our first uh, presenter, André Durocher, and I will let Zita present him. Thank you. 
It would be hilarious if I started the presentation on mute and this is the art of crisis communication. It would just be funny. So welcome, André. If you all indulge me, I am going to read André's um, bio to just get a scope of how um, how well-versed he is in the topic. André de Rocher has been part of the media landscape for over 20 years now, representing the Montreal Police Service. Throughout these years, he's occupied the roles of Director of Police Department's Comms Division, Strategic Communications Advisor of the police, Chief of Police, as well as the Strategic Advisor for the Quebec Association of Chiefs of Police. As official corporate sponsor, spokesperson, excuse me, of the Montreal Police, he has developed He's developed an envied expertise in the field of crisis communications. He was the official spokesperson for Montreal Police when the COVID-19 pandemic struck and continued in that role until he went on to do the same with the Quebec Association of Chiefs of Police in September of 2020. André de Rocher has also been part of McGill's University School of Continuing Studies since 2005, where he lectures on public and media relations. Newly retired from the police last April, he is still frequently called upon various media to analyze and comment on various police-related matters. He is also a partner of Affirma Communications and Marketing as a media relations consultant with his spouse. Welcome, André. Thank you. Should I begin now? Yes, please. Okay. Well, I would like to say hi to everyone, even though I can't, I can't see you all where you are. Uh, thank you for taking the time to attend this uh, humble uh, presentation that we're all going to try to do to give you information. First of all, before beginning, uh, since this is recorded also, I like to have, I always give a little disclaimer. Uh, the presentation I'm doing today, I am speaking on behalf of myself, not on behalf of the police department. That's very important. And, uh, you know, I'm not there either to, either to make politics. I would like to say, despite some of the criticism I'll make in the presentation, uh, I think that politicians, no matter what parties, what level, everybody did their best under the circumstances with the information we had uh, during the COVID. So now that I made the disclaimers, the, the fine print, I'm going to go and set, give you the setting so that, and the reason I'm doing this is to avoid, like during the time I present in order to stop and to have to explain the context. Remember in our culture in Quebec, we're lucky to live in a society that's, you know, free and it's not, um, we're not used to have the government imposing measures on us uh, that restrain our liberties. So every step the government has to take to restrain our liberties becomes almost, uh, can, can become, I mean, a political nightmare because we know that the opposition is going to say, oh, this is terrible, you're restraining our rights, whatever. So they're going very slowly. As a matter of fact, take a look right now what's going on with the passport, vaccination passport. They've been giving you the target for weeks. We knew we were going there, but we're like little babies. We're not ready to go there immediately. We have to take baby steps. Eventually, we still end up there. So that's basically uh, the introduction, the setting, and the last one. Uh, during the pandemic, because it was new for everybody, there was a lot of contra uh, contradictory information due to the lack of information at the beginning of the crisis. So it complicated things. Remember at first, because the government knew that we didn't have enough masks, telling people it's useless to wear masks and then making masks mandatory, that only serves to give munition to people who want to contest the, the guidelines and everything. So now I think you're, you're all ready. Uh, so just to give you an idea, although the imp impacts of um, the, the pandemic were, you know, touch more than just like health. It touches our economy, touches everything, our education system. Uh, it's not something that is a public safety crisis, but yet the police ended up in the middle of this crisis, despite everything. So just to give you an insight, as early as late February, even though it wasn't confirmed, we were starting to get signals that something very big was coming in terms of pandemic. And, you know, the signs saying, you know, if this keeps going this way, this is where we are heading. We knew this about two, three weeks before. So we were already starting uh, planning because what are we going to do with, for example, our personnel is affected. How will we uh, proceed like in order like to do the shifts in order for people not to cross each other? Like a lot of measures were being taken before it even came about. But then again, that's what we do as a police department. We have to plan for the unplanned. Like if tomorrow uh, a major fire or earthquake hits the uh, police headquarters, there's an equivalent center somewhere secret, like you have to be able to respond. 
So everything started with March 12th. The state of emergency is declared on March 12th. People were asked to assist public health authorities. Now that's very unusual in our thing because of course, okay, what's the police going to do? I mean, I'm not qualified to know, uh, you know, somebody's got COVID symptoms if they represent the danger. So it's brand new for us. And also it's, um, it's a section of the um, Quebec health law, which is very, very seldom used. So we had to get that information. We had to be able to process it. Our legal affairs department had to look after it. Then they have to translate this for the officers that are on the ground, having to you know, answer the various questions uh, of the public regarding the crisis. So on March 12th, everything started. So rumors started left and right. Don't forget in the crisis nowadays, we have to communicate even more than before because with social media, if the vacuum is left there, somebody else is gonna fill that gap and not necessarily somebody that you want to fill that gap. And I always say when I, I teach crisis communication, I say the two people that are most likely to argue in a boardroom in a corporation are legal affairs and communications. Because with the lawyers, it's very easy. Don't say anything, you'll never get in trouble. So it's very easy. You don't apologize for anything. You don't admit anything, you don't say anything. Even when I used to be a police officer on the road arresting people, they said, I wanna call my lawyer. I said, you know what? I'm gonna save you a lot of money. Don't tell me anything. That's what your lawyer is gonna say, don't talk. It's as simple as that. So you have to remember, so I mentioned it involved many agencies, uh, public safety, the police department, city hall, uh, politicians, um, health authorities. Uh, so these agencies are not necessarily used to working together. So at the beginning, it was very clumsy because what happened is you have, when you have the Quebec premier going on television and saying, okay, starting tomorrow, this is what's illegal. You're not allowed to gather more than three people, four people, you know. People, of course, call the police and they say, okay, well, I, I just want to make sure I don't get, get in trouble. So what am I going to do? Don't forget, it's not because the premier says this is going to be illegal tomorrow that the police can enforce it because there has to be a decree. There has to be a law. Uh, how do you make the difference between, we do not recommend that you do this or we recommend that you do that. You can't sanction people or ticket people for something that you recommend. And also to add to the whole confusion in that situation, on March 23rd, the police de department declared the state of emergency. That scared people. That's when I said, enough is enough. We have to communicate. Because don't forget, in a lot of people's mind, particularly people that are from countries where you know there are dictatorships, they say the police is calling the state of emergency, giving police extraordinary powers. Well, that was true, but not exactly true. What I mean by that, when a police chief in Montreal declares the state of emergency, that's what, in accordance with the convention, uh, collective bargaining agreement. So it gives the police chief powers to change the shifts, to cancel vacations, to give orders to people to stay at work. It has nothing to do with the police giving itself extra powers. We had to clarify that. That's the point at which I decided, um, despite all the advice, I would say from legal department, don't do this, whatever. I said, we have to do it. It's going to secure people. Because so for th those of you who are probably a lot younger than me, uh, I was eight years old when it was the October crisis in 1970. And the War Measures Act was invoked. And a lot of people were actually invoking that. I said, hey, it's not the same thing. Let's, you know, the calmer people are, the more information they have, the easier it's going to be for everyone. So I'm going to show you a little video clip of an interview with Matsumi Takahashi to show you what I'm trying to, in other words, I'm, I'm walking the walk and talking the talk. You'll see I'm doing exactly what I'm telling you. So if I'm gonna share the screen with you. Uh, which part is it over here? Uh, you're trying, hang on, something. Somebody's trying to tell me something. I'm gonna see what it is. Yeah, it's just at the bottom. Is this, are you, and no, you I see it. I'm just trying to. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. I'm trying to see it appear. Uh, it's got to be here. Hang on for a second. That's not the one. Okay, I've got it. 
You all see this? Okay. To explain what these new powers are for the police in Montreal, Inspector Andre de Rocher with the SPVM joins us now. And thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Very important to communicate during those tough times. If you would allow me, Mitsumi, I'd just like to clarify the situation regarding what the, you call the state of emergency. What we declared is a provision in the collective agreement of the police officers. So it's not giving the police officers more power. What it's giving is the director of the police department more power and more maneuver for his human resources. For example, the power to change shifts, the power to uh, cancel uh, vacations, the power to take people that are in administrative duties and put them on the road. Those are the types of power. So it's something internal. So I'd like to reassure the population that we're not, we're not ourselves declaring that we're giving us ourselves more power. And that's very important for us to clarify. Okay, well, thank you very much for clarifying that because that is very, very important. We'd like to know though, what exactly will police be doing now in the streets of Montreal? Well, for the, uh, you know, for citizens uh, going about the streets of Montreal, and there are fewer and fewer of them, as you might have seen, uh, they won't see the difference. But for us, the uh, main thing is the... Uh with the article uh, being invoked, the section 12 of the collective agreement, it allows the, uh, we can go on 12-12 in terms of shifts. Just to give you an idea, on a given day in Montreal, there are three groups of police officers working day, evening, and night. By going by just day and night, 12 hours, we're just, you know, we have our officers, there are just two groups that are present there on the road the number of patrol officers will be the same, but at least it's allowing the other, uh, the other two groups, if you want to, uh, to re not to relax, but to get some rest. And because we don't know how long the whole crisis is going to, uh, to take. And we have to keep in mind, uh, we have uh, two officers, two cases confirmed uh, that have contracted the disease, not while working, but while they were on vacation. So we have to look at the future, say what happens, for example, if we have to uh, have uh, 100, 200 police officers quarantined, we have to be able to give that service to the population. This is why we invoke that article. And it's very reassuring for the population to know that we're doing that. But also uh, the police department is counting on the cooperation of the population to respect the guidelines that have been given by the uh, premier uh, last Saturday. Now, I'd like to understand what exactly though, in terms of the premier's directive, that people not be in groups inside or outside. Um, if someone, for example, is seen to have broken quarantine restrictions, what will the police be doing in these cases? Well, the role of police in these cases, because it's a it's a sanitary crisis, it's not a you know a, not a case of a criminal or anything. So what we're doing is we are there to support uh, the public health. So the what we're doing is we're there as a as a support unit. So what we're doing is let's say the um, uh, here, let's say you have a gathering. First of all, the term gathering, if you notice, there is no specific number. Uh, legally speaking, a gathering is two people or more. With that being said, it, does, it doesn't mean that the police is going to be coming down on people that are walking two by two, whatever. The idea behind it, and I think most of the population is getting the message, it's to avoid uh, being close to one another because the virus, the virus will not jump from one person to the other. It will be contracted if somebody's sneezing, uh, they have it on their hands they touch somebody else. So it's just to keep uh, the distances. Uh, we've had in the past uh, two days, uh, roughly about 200 calls related to people who have, for example, said that there are either kids playing in the park or there are people doing a party and people cooperate. What the government has done last Saturday is give us the tool, the law, just give it to us it's there in case we do not wish to use it. We're not planning on using it. And, you know, hopefully we'll never have to resort to it. But, but we, right now, it's just a tool for us. We understand, though, that I think it was just a few days ago, I think it was police in Quebec City stopped a woman who had broken her quarantine. Are you capable of doing that? How would you know that, that this is happening? Well, first of all, we would have probably have, you know, it doesn't say, and your question is very good, it doesn't say if somebody's quarantined on their forehead, uh, I'm being quarantined. But if we do have a request, for example, uh, by the uh, public health department or by a health worker saying this person should be quarantined, uh, they're contagious, 
we would be assisting. And of course, the first steps would be to uh, speak to that person, inform them of the danger they, uh, that they present. And if they keep on going and saying, yes, 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 I, I don't care, then we could go as far as that. But that is really an extreme measure that would be only taken in an extreme situation. And finally, when should police, uh, when should people be calling police and when should they not be calling police. I would imagine that you're getting a lot of people calling that 911 line. <laughs> it's a very uh, delicate question to which I will give a very delicate answer. On one hand, there is good news. When people call, it's because there's a lot of social awareness. You know, you're saying, hey, this is wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. So that's good news. What we would not want is people to start saying, you know, like I mentioned, you see two people walking on the street say, don't do this, don't do that. Denunciation. We want if people are concerned, they feel there is a situation that could represent a danger, call the police, we will respond. But uh, we don't want to fall in an area where everybody's calling on their neighbor and, you know, uh, going like that. We're counting on people also to be um, civilized, uh, not to insult people. For example, we saw in certain reports on the news that people were insulting some senior citizens that were taking a walk. I mean, that's very irresponsible. And having, you know, uh, lived a, a few crises in, in my lifetime in the police, as the days go by, a lot of people will be on the edge. Please uh, act in a responsible manner. If there's any types of rumors that you hear, stay tuned, listen. There is, a, you know, a briefing given daily by the authorities. And the best thing is to be informed, stay indoors. The more people cooperate, hopefully the shorter this crisis will, will be. Okay. Thank you very much for taking time to speak to us today, Inspector Dulochi. Always a pleasure. Okay. So that, that sums it up, right? <laughs> uh, I'm just going to give you some, um, some extra information because that was, uh, this interview was at the beginning of the, uh, of the pandemic when it just began, but the principle remained the same. Uh, I'm going to tell you, share with you some of the situations we had that were very interesting, actually. When government authorities do stuff in a crisis situation, not everything is perfect. And you know the good old saying that says a good plan today is better than the perfect plan tomorrow. Well, that's certainly what authorities uh, did on a lot of occasions. For example, when they said, uh, and I mentioned during the, the interview, gatherings will be illegal. Okay, what's a gathering? Two, three, four, five. And then when they said, uh, you know, you can have gatherings, uh, you have to keep in mind they didn't want to they didn't want to prohibit people from taking public transportation. So they forgot to include public transportation. What do you think happened? A lot of teenagers were getting together in cars, four, five, six people in the car, just chilling. So they weren't illegal, theoretically. So it just goes to show you how creative people get. So you have to, you have to get the laws very straight. And what happened after a while, obviously, the information that you get, because you have to be grounded like, speak to the people who are actually applying the law, the officers on the ground would bring the information back up to say, those are the problems we're facing. So what it led to uh, is was serious discussions with the, uh, the Ministry of Justice, with the Ministry of Public Safety to say, could you please consult us when you are about to put new guidelines so that we could tell you, are they enforceable or not? Uh, because when you get when you get to enforce something, I know the idea is that we're trying to you know to change our behavior very quickly. They don't want to be too coercive. However, there are there will always be people who want to be martyrs and uh, make it a statement or something on YouTube. We saw somebody at some point in a, in a, a Tim Hortons that wanted to be arrested, not wearing the mask. So you have to be um, as clear as possible. Uh, you, you remember at some point the premier was saying we have social distancing two meters or six feet. Well, do you all know that two meters and six feet is not the same? There's about two or three inches difference. So what do you base yourself on? If you have to go to court and you can test this, you're gonna say, okay, was it two meters or six feet? And if so, how did you measure? And this is what I always say, not now that you know we're on a, in a different step in the crisis, I could say it. I would be curious to know the ratio of people who receive actual tickets for not respecting social distancing to how many will actually win it or how many will be thrown out of court for lack of evidence. However, with that, and I mentioned it uh, before, we cannot blame the government. The idea is to try to contain people because as you know, in a society, most of the people will abide. 
you always have a small percentage for whom you will always have to go with coercition. But nevertheless, just goes to show you the importance of communicating the information to reduce the tension, to, um, to help people cooperate. So when you do something, you have to say what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, and even how you're going to do it. This way, people will be more receptive. They'll trust you. And in crisis communication, you have to seize every opportunity you have to communicate because situations evolve very quickly. Uh, there's a lot of false rumors. Also, when you know that you're going to be in it for the long run, and I mentioned it during the interview, you have to, uh, the, for example, uh, with regards to the media, as soon as new measures were announced, we were getting requests from uh, various media saying, uh, okay, uh, could we have uh, our journalists follow your police officers? Uh, the new measure comes into uh, effect at midnight tonight. At midnight, at 001 minute, they would call and they would say, have you arrested anybody yet with regards to that? What are your stats? So you have to say, take it easy. We will give you the numbers once a week, every Monday, just like the government did with the statistics regarding COVID every day at around 10 o'clock, I believe in the morning. So you have to plan for the long term like that. Otherwise, you don't see the end and you spend a lot of time from the uh, perspective of communication people working on stuff that's needless. So you have to set, set specific rendezvous. Uh, also with the, uh, with the political authorities, what it led to is better cooperation. They realized that by, um, by asking us and consulting, I mean, they still took the decisions, but when consulting, they made laws or uh, measures, decrees that were a lot easier to apply. And then I'm going to make a small switch over to the uh, Quebec Police Association. My role over there was to ensure that communications were uniform. If you remember, particularly when the government introduced the various zones, so Montreal was a green, uh, red zone, and then your South Shore was a yellow zone. I had, my role was to not only communicate with the media, but also communicate with other police agencies and ensure coordination that everyone for example, as the same definition of what a illegal gathering is, under what circumstances, what will you tolerate, what will you not tolerate? Uh, something very simple, again, when you have to be clear. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but in some parks in Montreal, it is legal to consume alcohol if you take a meal. I'm sure if I ask each and every one of you, what's the definition of a meal? Is it a bag of chips with a, ball, with a case of 24 beers? Yeah, what's yeah. a meal? And that's, you have to get those definitions because what some people would, would do, and I, I've seen it, I, I used to go on the road with the patrol officers to, to see it. You have 10 people gathered around a fire with three cases of beer and two bags of chips. So people push things to the, the limit, you know, and those, those are real examples. However, uh, you, it shows how important it is to communicate. Uh, I see that I, I'm uh, using up a lot of time. I'm going to Go and give you basically lessons learned uh, from all that, just to reinstate the importance in, a communi in communication, uh, crisis communication, the importance of communicating as quickly as possible. And if you don't know everything, say it immediately. Uh, you know, be, you know, when you can affirm something, say it. When you can't, say it also. But be very careful because in a state of crisis, people remember what they wish to remember. So you have to be very clear. You have to keep your communication uh, very, very uh, basic. Uh, also, in order to reduce the demands uh, with regards to media, set some specific rendezvous or, or guidelines. If you know it's gonna be a long crisis, set specific dates or times at which you will uh, transmit the information. Don't neglect and don't forget your internal communication. Uh, it's so important. I'm going to give you a little anecdote that has nothing to do with the COVID-19, but that's very important. When I started uh, a few years ago, over 20 years ago, actually, we, there was a, a specific program for people that would return guns. There was a general amnesty. So it told people, you know, a lot of people inherit guns or uh, different weapons from their grandfather, their grandparents. And we told them, if you don't want to register them, bring them to any police station. And, you know, no questions asked, we're going to take them. However, uh, we were a little deficient in our internal communication. So some people were walking into a police station with a rifle. 
we are lucky that nothing, uh, no tragedy happened because the officers didn't have the information about this general amnesty. We are not validated, made sure that the information had made it all the way down. Now, 20 years later, we can laugh about it. Nothing bad happened, but it just goes to show you how clear you have to be. If you work for a corporation and you have a certain philosophy or a certain uh, uh, motto by which you live by, if your employees are not aware of it, don't forget your employees are your brand ambassadors. So it's important to make sure the, uh, all the information is there. And again, communication, the art, uh, crisis communication is like skating or like painting. There's a part you can learn, but there's a part that's a bit artistic, which you can never, that can never be taught, but that normally if you practice, you'll get better at it. There was a golfer who once said, people say I'm lucky because I'm very good. And I say, you know what, the more I practice, the luckier I get. On these words, I'd like to say thank you everyone for listening. Thank you so much, André. Uh, you said a lot of very, very interesting things that I think uh, people in the audience, uh, I mean, I don't know, but I took a note of that. Uh, quite a few things. I really liked, uh, um, you know, your lessons learned. I think that's important. If you allow me, I think I'll repeat them just so that everybody can uh, hear them once again. So it's uh, communicating as quickly as possible. Uh, admitting that you don't know certain things, but at the same time, being careful not to say things that, you know, uh, being conscious of the fact that people will remember what they want to remember. I think that was very, uh, very interesting. Be very clear with your message, almost uh, as if, uh, you know, in plain English, as we say, you have to speak in very plain English. Um, set special uh, terms uh, of how you will be communicating with media. Uh, so that they don't distract you from your work and that, uh, you know, don't uh, come and uh, try to get information every five minutes. And the last one really resonates a lot with me. You said, don't neglect internal comms. And it resonates a lot with me because um, I actually come from a corporate background. And for many years, I was in internal communications. And I'm really sorry if you hear my dog in the background. Uh, but I very much believe in the fact that your employees are your ambassadors and it's not just by respect but like you said it's for very very strategic reasons you need to make sure that your employees are aware of any actions you want to do you will be announcing before you go public and I think if we go back uh, maybe 20 years ago Internal communications has never been, you know, looked upon as uh, the glamour of, of communications. It's always media, external relations. But, you know, nowadays, a lot of large uh, corporations, large and small corporations and organizations, they understand the, the value of internal communication. So I think the balance is tipping. So thank you very much for that, Andrea. I think these are very, very good lessons for everyone to, to remember in crisis. And like you delivered like in the best way of crisis communications, very clear. I like the, uh, the ending. So thank you very much. And we'll come back uh, to you with other questions. But I think we're ready to go on to our second um, expert, Francois Olivier. And I will once again let uh, Zita introduce him. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you for that, André. Um, now to introduce Francois Olivier Lancelot. Uh, Francois Olivier is a sport event planning advisor for the City of Montreal and an event management lecturer at McGill. Prior to joining the City of Montreal, he was an, on the organizing committee of the 2015 World Junior Championship and the 2015 FIFA Women's World Cup, the 2016 Mogul World Cup in Val Saint Como, and the IJF Grand Prix in 2019. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, André, for your presentation. Um, a little bit of what I'm going to talk about uh, will resonate with what André said. Uh, that being said, my presentation will be a little more theoretical on a macro level than uh, André or, uh, you know, I'm not going to go as, as deep in, in details with certain events. So uh, let's, let's get going with the presentation. Good. All right, so um, crisis communication and event planning. 
So I will not present myself as uh, Zita did for, for me. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so as you heard, and as you can see, my expertise lies in event management. So uh, first, what is crisis communication in terms of uh, event management? So it's the means and protocols an organization, or in this case, an event promoter, has to effectively address a major threat or a risk. Now, before we get started, um, before we get to the communication aspect, we need to address the threat part. We, it's also known as, or, or, or in, in event management, risk management. So we need to address that first. Uh, when planning an event, it's essential for any organization to make a risk management plan. Every event will face a variety of risks. There are no risk-free events. It's, it's simply impossible. And we don't make these, these risk management plan just to uh, create a crisis plan or a crisis communication plan afterwards. We make these risk management plan um, for safety reason. We make these plan because your the different government agencies like the city of Montreal will, will ask for them. They want to make sure that the citizens, that the participants are safe, that you thought about your financial risk, that your event will be a success. So the first step in making your risk management plan is to identify the potential risk. And we'll see that in the next slide, what uh, these potential risks could be. The second step would be to assess your risks. And finally, so assess your risk means, you know, uh, the probability of it happening and the consequences. Finally, how to manage or avoid these risks. Some you'll have to accept. So the potential risk. Uh, so we have, you know, natural disaster, heavy rain, snow. Some hockey games in Dallas, Texas were canceled this winter because they weren't prepared for such cold temperature. There was uh, electricity shortage all over the city hail, heat. The 2017 Montreal Marathon was canceled due to heat. Uh, just today, the um, Canada-Sweden uh, soccer game, gold medal game, was postponed from midday uh, noon to uh, later at night because of the heat in Tokyo. Uh, financial risk. We can think of fire Festival. Anyone? Uh, unforeseen costs, lower revenue, fraud, cash flow crisis, legal risk, disputes over a contract, human made, theft, vandalism, um, technology related risk. We, we see these a lot more in the past 18 months, right? With virtual events. Uh, we didn't have necessarily had these problems before, but problems with computers, projection, platforms, um, mismanagement, disputes at the top. Uh, top management or simply bad planning, safety and security. Um, Boston Marathon 2013, riots, terrorism, food safety, exhaustion, drugs. I mean, that's pretty much any music festival across the world, right? Um, injuries. We've seen hockey games that were delayed or canceled because of a gruesome injury or a death. Uh, temporary structures collapsing. Fire risk, pretty much anything can be a source of ignition. And finally, moral, ethical, religious risk, you no know, having uh, an event during a holiday, for example. Well, now that we've listed the potential risk, it's time to identify which one could happen during your event, uh, how and when they could happen. Uh, there are many different ways to identify the risk, you know, test events, uh, every sport or discipline in the Olympic Games have test events in the same venue prior to the Olympic Games, you know, it's a good way to test what could happen. Uh, you could break down your event to the micro level, uh, it'll help you know exactly what happened during each sequence, consult professionals. Every major event we hold in Montreal, um, we identify certain risk with professionals. So the Montreal Marathon, for example, will work on their risk management plan with the SPVM in regards to terrorist threats. They'll work with Urgence Santé 
for uh, medical risk or their medical planning. It's also important to use previous reports. You know, documenting incidents is, is one of the most important risk control process. Um, demonstrate, it, it demonstrate that an appropriate process was in place. It provides a record of incidents and responses, allows for monitoring and review improvement in the future. Uh, and this will result in reduction in problems, accidents, decrease potential liability, uh, improve workplace performance and customer satisfaction, and of course, avoid negative exposure. So now that you've identified your risk, you, it's time to assess them. So it's basically the analysis of the likelihood of the risk happening and its consequences. This will help you prioritize the different issues for attention. To do that, you can ask you know, yourself different question. What's the likelihood of this risk happening? Who will be exposed to the risk? What impact has this risk had in similar events? And how will people react to the risk? Um, without going too much into the theory, here's like a, a little matrix where um, you, know, you have high probability risk with low consequences you can accept or manage. And at the opposite, low probability, high consequences you want to manage high probability, high consequences, avoid or manage if possible. Um, examples of how to manage your risk. Uh, this is the final step, right? Once you've identified, you've assessed them. So uh, elimination plan to completely eliminate the risk. So covering walkways to protect spectator from rain, uh, looking for a better substitution plan. So looking for better design stands that will cover the rain for your spectators. Uh, isolation plan, isolating dangerous equipment, using safety barriers and fences uh, to limit control of crowds. Those are engineering controls. Administrative controls would be putting up warning signs, training your staff. And finally, contingency plan, uh, developing an evacuation plan in, in which the risk cannot be completely avoided. So now that we've done our risk management plan, now we can start working on the crisis communication plan, right? And we'll see why we needed to do this part first. So your uh, crisis communication plan, first step would be to create your crisis communication team. You know, it could be composed of your CEO, uh, your executive director or general manager, your heads of departments, lawyer, a specialized communication firm, if you've hired one, uh, lawyer, same thing, if you you have one on, on retainer or you have one in your organization. Uh, identify your spokesperson, train them. They, they need to know how to speak in public. They need to know how to do interviews, you know, what, what to say, what not to say, like making jokes about the incidents or saying we weren't prepared for this or for that. And like André said, remember, communication, they're external, they're also internal. When you try to communicate with your stakeholders, it also means your staff. It also means uh, uh, the government agency. When we do communiques or when, when the promoters I work with, they write communiques, for example, when, when the, um, their events are canceled, because of COVID, they run it by us first. They want, are you guys okay with what we're gonna write in our communique? And then we, we, we agree, we make some changes and then they can publish it, right? So there's a lot of work that's done in the back scene with all the different stakeholders. Then you need to identify your communication channels. Uh, the channel you'll use will depend on your audience and, of course, on the nature of the incidents. So you're going to use social media, a press conference, a communique. Uh, if it's a simple delay because of technical difficulties, you might want to use social media to get the information out there fast. If your target audience is uh, they're professional in their 40s, you know, using TikTok to make your announcement might not be the greatest idea, right? I'm not a social media specialist, but that's not the way I would want to go. And again, as André said, uh, make sure your audience know what, what your official channels are, right? Because you don't want your, your audience or your stakeholders to get false rumored or get misinformed by unofficial challenge, the channels. Okay, so now something's happened. What do we do? We have a crisis. 
So um, whether you've anticipated it or not, the first thing you need to do is to accept that an incident has occurred or an issue has arised. It's the first thing you need to do. You know, summon your crisis team, find solutions, get ready to communicate with your stakeholders, prepare your message and get it out there. Now, the tough part is obviously uh, um, getting your message out there and preparing it. And there's no magic formula, right? Because it will always depend on the incident and it always will always depend on how you wanna uh, transmit, convey that message. With your crisis team, you'll have to elaborate the message you want to convey and how often you want to communicate with them. Uh, depending on the crisis, I know Andre said, you know, the lawyers, they'll just say, don't say anything, uh, avoid saying anything. But as an event uh, manager, I would say sometimes you, you're better off consulting with them before putting your message out there. You also, and then one of the most important reason why you would want a crisis team and communicate with your stakeholders is to control your message, control the information. Um, be as transparent as possible. Do not neglect the consequences of the incident. Do not say you have nothing to declare or you weren't ready. Uh, the last thing you want is you to get your, your audience misinformed from unofficial challenge. You do not want the medias to report rumors or incorrect information. You also want to foresee potential questions. So let's say you're, you're doing a communique, right? We go back to the marathon example. It's canceled because of COVID-19. Okay, as a runner, as a participant, what do I want to know? Well, I want to know why the race is canceled. Have you done anything in your power to make the race happen, the marathon happen? Is it canceled or is it postponed? Will it happen at a later date? How will I be, re will I be reimbursed? Or what are my options? Can I, can I push my payment for next year's? You know, if you have all these information in the same communique, you'll probably save a lot of time and a lot of trouble in the future. Finally, uh, you know, Provide timely updates. It, it, it always depends on the nature of the incident. Again, meeting, depending on, on the incident, you might have to meet the press. Uh, offering a public response in, in such cases is essential. Say, say for in 2018, the death, uh, 2019, the death of a participant in the Montreal Marathon. You want to know as much as possible the facts. You want to be as transparent as possible. Be prepared for potential questions, right? You don't want to go up there and say, well, I don't know the answer. Sorry, I have nothing to say. Have solutions ready, if possible, or how you'll mitigate the risk or how you'll, you'll uh, uh, circumvent the situation. So why do we do all this? Why do we prepare for so much for a risk that might not even happen, right? Um, you know, it's to maintain your reputations, to maintain your image. It's to keep your participants, keep your customers for the next edition, the next year. Avoid additional costs, avoid additional delays. Promoters uh, that are planning events right now, they have to deal with so much more regulation because of COVID. They need to have sanitary protocols in place. They need to have them approved by all the different health agencies. And trust me, if and now, so, so they're letting more and more events happen, right? Because they want to, you know, give something to the population. They, they've been, we've been doing nothing for the past 18 months, right? The first, first event that was canceled was in March, uh, a week, a week after March 12th, the, um, the world uh, skating figure skating world championship was canceled. We haven't seen any major events since then. So they need to have all these protocols approved. And trust me, if a now break does happen in those few events that they're accepting right now, you can be sure the organizers, they'll be asked to answer for what happened. How come, you, you know, is the population protected? Is it contained? They'll have to make a public appearance and they'll have to be ready for that. At the end of the day, why we do this, it, 
It's to show our stakeholders we care about them. We care about their safety. We care about their security. It's about showing them. It's about showing your internal stakeholders, your external stakeholders. We were as ready as we could be. You know, when I teach my, I, I teach my, uh, my students, I, te I tell my students, you know, you can plan for 90% of your event, but it's that little 10% of unexpected incidents. You can't prepare for it, but you have to be ready. You have to be able, able to turn around, fix your mistakes. And if you can, come out to the public and tell them what happened and how you're going to fix it. So at this point, I do hope you understand why we're making, before making the communication plan, it's essential we do the risk management plan, right? Um, so conclusion, you create your risk management plan, identify, assess, manage your risk. Then you can create your crisis plan, create your crisis team, identify the proper channels, prepare your message, get it out there. And if anything does happen, please do not say we weren't prepared for this or we didn't know. This is a death sentence for your organization. I know this was a lot more theoretical than the previous uh, um, presentation, but I do hope you liked it and um, thank you for listening. It was great, uh, François-Olivier. Thank you so much for it. Uh, I think it really complemented very well André's uh, presentation. Um, it also made me think about how people think a communicator's job is really just communicating. And in fact, it's so much more. There's so much more work that goes into this. Uh, who, who would think from outside of this profession that risk management is part of a communicator's job? I mean, you usually think about event planning, it's part of communications, but risk management, it's, it's quite different and it is part of our job, or at least we have to surround ourselves with experts who can help us think about all the different possibilities and plan for them. And so I thought this was interesting. Um, I also uh, laughed when you said there are no risk-free events. So true, so true. And um uh, it's hard. Event planning is very, very hard. And a lot of times you're at the mercy, like you said, of various things that, that you cannot control. You know, you cannot control weather, you cannot control a world pandemic. Um, exactly. And, uh, you know, so something, it echoed a little bit what Andre was also saying about plan for the unplanned. And so I have a question for both of you, Andre and um, Francois Olivier. How do you plan for the unplanned? I mean, Number one thing that everybody tells you in crisis communications is planning, planning and planning. Who could have planned for, for the pandemic? I mean, yes, we could have thought that something like that could happen, but that's, you know, it's almost the unthinkable that the whole economies would be shut down. People would not be going anywhere. We'd have uh, emergency states in, in countries. People would not, kids would not go to school. I mean. This is crazy, and we just lived through that. How could you have been prepared for something like that? Well, André, do you mind if I... No, no, go ahead. Uh, okay. My perspective on the event management size. Uh, well, a pandemic, or let's say a tornado, a earthquake, um, it would be what we call an act of God, right? And those are pretty much the only category we, we can't really plan for. Um, you can manage it. And uh, Wimbledon has done it before. So in 2020, when, when um, SRAS won, uh, was an outbreak in, I believe it was in 2003, when there was the first SRAS outbreak, uh, Wimbledon in England, they took an insurance, a million, a million pound a year, something like that, to cover financial losses in case of pandemic. So they spent pretty much 17 million pounds in 17 years and it, it paid off. It paid off a lot more in 2020 because they were ready. Nowadays, uh, insurance for, for events management or, or event promoters, they cost a lot more because now they include it in there and your, your fees are, are a lot higher. Um, I don't think you can plan for an act of God 
but what you can do is is you have to be ready to turn around right you have to be ready okay so we're shutting down the event for x y reason okay so what do we do what's our game plan if we need to shut down our event yeah and i think what i've read also is that you cannot plan for a specific scenario necessarily it's like we used to plan what if then you know but nowadays we almost have to plan for decision making process you know allow me maybe one of the things uh, i find that the term crisis very often is used too loosely what i mean by this uh when i do um contracts with private companies now i work as risk management director for a transport company uh no matter what type of organization you are i always tell the people your homework is going to be to identify me five situations that are likely to happen or that may happen. Here, McGill University. Remember with the Me Too thing. Okay, if I was to talk to McGill, say, okay, what are situations that can happen in link with that? Well, you may have a student that will allege that uh, an instructor had an inappropriate behavior. Uh, situations like that. And if any company, if you take those four or five situations likely to happen and you already put sort of a, I call it a skeleton, a framework in, in, in place. You're prepared because what's a crisis? A crisis is something that's unexpected. And I do agree with uh, Francois that you cannot maybe plan for the act of God. However, you can plan for the consequences of the act of God. So if there is a tornado, what do you do? I'm in a transportation company. What do we do if our trucks cannot deliver? So there is still some sort of, uh, of planning. Completely agree. Well, it's, it's kind of like the pandemic in Wimbledon. They couldn't stop. They can't stop a pandemic from happening, but they can save face on the financial risks or the financial consequences of having their event canceled. Yeah, same thing. I remember a few years back, a presentation a contract I did for an ambulance company. I said, what's likely to happen? What do you do? You transport people. So what can happen? One of your driver kills somebody driving too fast, going to end. One of your driver was deemed not driving fast enough and therefore somebody died in the ambulance. You manipulate human beings. Could be room for inappropriate behavior, stuff like that. They were all happy. I said, yeah. I said, look back 20 years ago and all the situations that you had with these situations I just gave you, we just covered the basics. Something happens tomorrow evening. Already, you know, who's going to be around the table? What needs to be done? Who does what? So imagine all the time you say, particularly given the fact with social media, it used to be in crisis communication, you had 24 hours to respond. There was like the whole news cycle. Now one hour is tops to at least stop the, you know, the, the pipe that's broken, and then you do your stuff. So that's why it's so important to, uh, to plan ahead. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, I I think this is very interesting. It's an interesting discussion. And I like uh, the approach about, uh, you know, uh, don't plan for specific things, plan for a few specific things and use that as a basis on, uh, on how to manage the situation. You cannot necessarily prevent it, but you can manage it. I like that approach. Uh, thank you very much. So before we go to our next uh, expert, uh, who is an expert on translation, um, I just wanted to mention something. We've, you know, we've touched on different uh, aspects of crisis communication, but we have not spoken about translation. And at first it might appear that, you know, why translation and crisis, but it is an integral, pre integral pre uh, part of crisis um, management. And um, if we just think about the numbers, According to the last census in Canada, about 4 million Canadians speak French, but do not speak any English. We have Inuktitut as an official language in Nunavut, and there are over 200,000 speakers of 70 indigenous languages in Canada. Almost 8 million Canadians have a first language other than French or English. Just hearing these numbers makes you think of how important translation is. And now I will let uh, Zita uh, present our next uh, expert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And to your point, Dina, it makes you question how information in crisis is going out. And Lucia, we are really excited 
to hear your insights on that and allow me to introduce you accordingly. Lucia Dorier has graduated with a bachelor's degree in communications, has been working in media and communications industry for eight years. She now specializes in building relationships and creating synergies between companies in this field. Lucia will take a deeper look at why translation is a key component of a successful crisis communications plan and will examine a few case scenarios and touch on the pivotal tool that AI has become in this context. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you, Zira. Thank you, Dina, uh, for this great introduction and the, uh, the quick synopsis that you gave, Dina, to help put us in context, uh, in context uh, sorry, translation in that crisis communication uh, that, we're, that we're, we were discussing. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here and, and bring a, a spotlight on the role and the importance of uh, translation in crisis communication, uh, particularly, like you mentioned, Zita, how artificial intelligence has been pivotal in uh, reimagining that role as new possibility emerge um, thanks to that technology and the de tremendous developments that we've had in the last year. Uh, traditionally, translation is sewn into a strategy of crisis communication. I think uh, Francois and uh, André can testify to that. It's um, translation is part of the early stages that we start planning just because of the nature of the work and really when it comes down to it, the time it takes to complete the work. Uh, so typically in translation, the process is that you would have a linguist completing the work, so the, the core of the translation, and then you have another linguist that reviews the work. So you can imagine how much time that takes and, and just how much preparation goes into it. Um, I'll take a, a, a deeper dive into how that has changed so much uh, with AI and, and we'll, we'll touch a bit more on that later. Um, when it comes to, to translation and crisis communication, uh, it will be a bit different depending on whether it's a, a setting where it's for corporate corporations or a corporate setting, or if it's um, a government trying to emit communications to for its citizens. Although the goal is really the same, it is uh, to, when we include translation, it's an effort to bridge the gap in culture and create common understanding, uh, something can be considered gauche or it can be considered a faux pas for an audience and it's completely acceptable for, for another. So it's, uh, it's really, when it comes down to it, it's as human beings, we have a lot of biases and preferences. And, and one of them is actually that we prefer to consume information in our native, native language. Uh, so it's for that reason that messages can't simply be a, a copy paste when it comes to translation. It needs to be tweaked. It needs to resonate with different cultures and, and different audiences. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. So a case study, if you will. Uh, our team worked closely with the government of Canada for their COVID vaccine campaign. Uh, they included communication. It was a decision by the government of Canada to include communications in Spanish as well as Hindi uh, to make sure that they reached and connected with the widest audience possible. And just, uh, looping back to what you were saying, Dina, just the, the sheer stats of the amount of people that speak other languages in, in Canada is just uh, so vast that they really had no choice if they wanted to make a, a true dent in, in people getting vaccinated. Now, uh, thanks to AI, uh, artificial intelligence, the role of translation in crisis communication is, is quite different. Uh, it's the beginning of the food feedback loop in crisis communication. Uh, further to what uh, André was saying before, where the officers on the ground are the feedback loop that can uh, share what is actually going on and how people are interpreting this message. Um, I think uh, AI is playing that role for, for corporations. Uh, what I mean by that is that there's a, a need to quickly and efficiently understand what is being said out there about corporations um, and how they can respond accordingly, um, especially when they do media monitoring and then they try to see, you know, like how are people reacting to a particular issue or a, a particular crisis that we have on our hands. Um, so it's that need to understand, like, what are people saying in different languages? How is this being reported in other countries? Uh, how is it being discussed? How can we respond and make sure that we don't commit those faux pas and, and, and look quite gauche? 
Um, I'll give you another example. We worked uh, where AI was pivotal. We worked uh, with, uh, I don't know if you remember, I think it was a month ago or so, uh, there was a leak in an operation in the Gulf of Mexico for a gas uh, um, exploitation. Um, I'm sure you all saw the images and in the videos, it, it was quite an impressive visual. Uh, the news got picked up around the world that it got reported in dozens of different languages. Uh, so for the communication team, it was uh, very important to um, understand uh, what was being said out there and respond uh, efficiently and quickly. So AI was essential for them just because of the sheer volume of, of articles and news coverage. Um, it was, again, it was essential to be able to run those articles and that coverage very quickly through the AI get a response almost instantly, and then being able to position themselves and, and see how they can respond to that. Um, so yeah, they wanted to be able to, to address the narrative as quickly as possible. And in this case, uh, translation didn't have to be perfect. They just needed to understand what's the key messaging, what are they saying, and how can we respond? Um, so that's why I was just great for them. Um, with AI, uh, there are much, much more possibilities. I just shared a, a narrow case scenario, uh, but now we can communicate quicker and have a better grasp on uh, what, the, what is being said out there and what is being reported. Um, I think it's gonna be essential in the upcoming years as uh, less and less people choose translation as a career, but there are more needs uh, for translation as uh, with globalization, for example, businesses have ramifications around the world and they need to understand in different languages and dialects, you know, what is being said and, and how can we respond to it. Thank you very much, Lucy. It's uh, super interesting. I, I, I think um, you mentioned that AI is the first step to closing that feedback loop. And I think that's super interesting as well because and a lot of times in crisis communications, we're so focused on providing the information and it's often one directional. How do you go and get that feedback from your audiences and what are they really perceiving, you know? Because people, and I think Andre at some point will also mention that, you know, we were saying this, but you don't know how people are really perceiving it and what they're reading into this. Everybody right. interprets their own, um, their own way so yes there is a translation interpretation in terms of different languages but there's also translation interpretation in terms of culture and tradition and your own personal background right so do you think that ai can help us with that i think it can uh just in in being able to uh as you mentioned, our own background is just so important. And sometimes we, we have our own biases, even as we translate. Uh, so having that uh, neutral uh, machine, being able to process that message and say, well, you know, in, in French, this is what we understand from it. And having a, an extra pair of eyes, I would say. Um, also, I think AI is just going to change the game in terms of the, the feedback loop and just being able to quickly and efficiently understand, you know, how are we as a corporation, for example, or, or as government, how are we perceived out there and how can we position ourselves? Because uh, like you said, we're sometimes in communications where we're so focused on getting a message out there, giving a response that we often forget that, well, you, we also have to do a temperature check. Like, are we doing a good job? Are we being understood how we want to be? So, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's also important you said, oh, this machine, it can it can help. But I think it's also super important in our day and age um, when anybody thinks they can be translators and interpreters <laughs> with the help of Google. We need to make sure that, you know, translation is is also an art. And, I, and I'm saying this because I actually started my career as a translator and interpreter. So mm -hmm. I feel very closely to the cause of uh, translators. And, you know, you see all, all these... Uh, uh, funny memes on social media about how a machine translated something and it's completely wrong and it has, you know, uh, no place of being there as a quality translation. How do you deal with that? How, where, where is the balance? You know, in a crisis communication, you have to communicate quickly. So there's a lot of pressure on the translators to get it out there. And 
And I know a lot of times as translators, we want to spend time and, you know, think about the nuances of the language and try to adapt it. How do you balance that with the need to communicate urgently versus communicating quality information? The short answer is with AI. <laughs> so basically huh? what AI allows you to do for a translator is uh, get the bulk of the message and then you can focus on finessing, uh, doing the worth smitting, uh, just making sure that the message is the right message uh, that you want to send uh, out there in the world. Uh, I also think that AI is not a replacement. It is a tool. It is an extra tool in your tool belt to be able to communicate, again, quickly and efficiently and make sure that we, we address uh, those crises uh, as, uh, as efficiently as possible. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, I don't know, uh, André and uh, François-Olivier, have uh, you worked closely with translators? Uh, do you have any questions uh, for Lucia? Well, actually, uh, I want to stress, yes, it is important to reach the people. And even I may add, uh, I was there during the ice storm in 1998, and we had to communicate with people. But let's not forget not only languages, but people who cannot hear people who are deaf uh, that we have to reach uh, inside residences. So it's very important to think about that, make sure they get the information. Absolutely, there's translation and interpretation on many, many different levels. And once again, it's the job of a communicator to think about all of this. Yeah, you have to think about, think about the unthinkable actually. Yes. <laughs> true, true. Um, do we offer the option to the audience, uh, anybody who wants to ask questions uh, to our panelists, please feel free. Uh, you can either raise your hand and ask them directly or type them in the uh, comments in the chat. Uh, we'll be very happy to, um, uh, to see your questions. Um, in the meantime, maybe I can uh, think of some other questions. <laughs> I think um, that I might jump on in if you're okay with that, Dina, yes, to, go ahead. Throw, to throw a question out about something André said near the beginning, and I'd like to hear the opinions of all of you. André said, you know, the public's perception of me getting the chance to give the messaging, because we were so confused at the very beginning of the pandemic with what rules were and so on and so forth, you know, allowed for him to have, you know, a better relationship, let's say, with the media and or public. But his relationship at work with his colleagues and or his his counterparts became a little bit shifty or volatile because that wasn't necessarily the messaging that they thought needed to go out. My question herein is, do you as an effective communicator in crisis management and crisis you know, navigation, how do you make sure that the rest of the team you're preparing with understands the nuance of getting these messages across to the public for the safety and or the understanding of folks, barring a, um, an act of God, because that's a little bit more easy to digest, right? If it's a tornado, people understand. If it's a fire, people seem to understand. And well, open it up to all of you. Well, you know, in, in order to be convincing, you need to be convinced. So when you're convinced about something, it should be easy to go and fight for it and to bear sometimes uh, a few professional scars. Uh, with that being said, one of the things in crisis communication is also the simplicity of the message. Uh, an interesting situation that happened uh, during the communications uh, in this, at some point there's six or seven of us at the table and we're trying to draft some messages and we couldn't, uh, we, we couldn't agree on a word, but the situation is really funny. We're talking six, seven people with at the very least bachelors, some master's degree and everything. So, you know, people that normally know uh, what they're talking about that are well-educated, nobody could uh, agree on the word. So they went into the dictionary to look for a word. And I said, you know what? We've got our answer. We haven't found our word, but we know that this is the word not to use. If six or seven of us cannot agree and we need a dictionary to know what it means, could you imagine what the population is going to think? When you communicate, particularly in crisis time, you should not require a dictionary in order to be understood. So it's, it's a simple, and then, you know, one of the things, another report, I couldn't find the, the clipping, but you know, with regards to social distancing, I mentioned before in my presentation, the two meters and the, uh, the six feet. Yeah. I remember there's a sort of a, 
a web thing I did with a with a reporter, and it did also the there was a report in the Journal de Montréal, and there was a picture of me and the reporter, just like that. She touches my hand, I touch hers, I said, "That's it. You've got your two meters there. It's okay. It may be two inches more or less depending on your height, but you pretty much got your thing. Police are not going to go around with a measuring tape." Simple, simple things. That's what people remember in crisis. Thank you. Francois or Lucia, would either of you like to take the take the question? Sure, I agree a, a lot with uh, André. I think, uh, like you said, the, it comes down to the simplicity and the, uh, the uh, making sure the message is as clear as possible. Uh, when it comes down to translation as well, you, you were mentioning, Dina, uh, translators sometimes have a tendency to try to make it um, as the message as, as pretty as possible. We want to use nice words and, and make it uh, uh, sound really nice, but sometimes it's, it's not that. The goal, you kind of have to remove your hat of translator and turn into a, an efficient communicator, which is uh, more important. And uh, once the message is, is out there, you don't control it anymore. So the only portion that you can control, you want to make sure that it is as clear as possible and that it resonates with the, with the audience. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Go ahead, Francois Olivier. Sorry. I was just going to say, I, I also agree. I mean, um, especially in events, it goes by so fast. If you have a multi day event and you have a message that uh, needs to go out right now before the following day, uh, it needs to be simple. It needs to be, everyone needs to understand it as fast as possible, right? Because there's no time to waste. Uh, show goes on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so uh, yeah, like this, the message was simple. The recording is in progress. Same thing with event management. You want to get your message out there. Everyone needs to understand it um, right away, right? Like Andre would say, we throw the dictionary in the garbage and we just focus on being clear. <laughs> yeah. And in regards to, uh, to, to planning for the uh, unthinkable, uh, Francois, I remember when I was uh, responsible for the uh, traffic division in Montreal, I don't know how many times I had event planners call me and say, I'm planning an event next week. You know where I could park 150 cars downtown. At such place, if something, they want to plan for the unthinkable. You get people, they need parking. What do you do if you organize an event at the corner of University in Sherbrooke? And hey, you're in Montreal. It's full of orange cones everywhere. Nobody could get there. Plan A, plan B, plan C. I used to organize uh, once a year the, uh, the drinking and driving campaign in the month. It was always held the last, uh, uh, the last Thursday of the month of November. We're in Montreal. You hold a press conference, ideally outdoors, but you have to have a plan B if it's too cold or if there's snow. So always a place where you could have those facilities. That's what I try to get uh, people to uh, develop as a reflex. You always have to be sure that you have another plan. And if you don't, make one up fast. <laughs> So thanks for that. You know, with the pandemic in mind, what has this taught the art of, of crisis communication? Is there now a default planning program or position in these communications companies that are thinking for large scale events like this? Or is it always there? Is it always something you're thinking about planning for the unexpected and you're just ready for something new? You have to, uh, one of the, I may say, you you do have to, to plan as much as possible, but you have to keep it simple. The best example I can give during the ice storm in 1998, I worked with the, um, uh, it was called the, the civil authorities, the emergency uh, civil authorities for the Montreal urban community back then. And of course, and, and police work or uh, ambulance or firefighters were used to responding immediately to stuff, to crisis right now and then. So, and, but those, the people we were, we were working with or teamed up with are people that are paid to do nothing but plans. They make plans, they're specialists. So during the, the ice storm, of course, all sorts of situations were happening. And you could see I was side by side with them. They're great people, but they were, by the time they were pulling out what they should do in their manuals that were about this thick, we had the situation solved. Because maybe, the, maybe they either never saw a crisis or the last time they saw one was 20 years ago. And you know they need to get the dust off their books and uh, you know get their plan in order. So you have to have a mix 
I like I like the idea of having what I mentioned before a frame. And then you just feed it as you go along and it goes very quickly. This way you don't get too confused and, and you don't put yourself, because every crisis, although there are similarities, there will, there will be differences. I always tell people in crisis communication when I teach it, I say, we are all making cake. Whether you're making vanilla cake, strawberry cake, chocolate cake, basic ingredients are the same. And then, you know, what makes a great chocolate cake and an ordinary one, that's the artistic part. It also, uh, just to further to your point, Andre, I think it, uh, it spotlighted just no one questions anymore if we need communications or even if, if this even is necessary. I think COVID uh, has just solidified the need and the validity to do those, uh, like Pascal was saying, do those um, uh, planning exercises, be prepared, have those wireframes. So that whenever the crisis does hit, then we are prepared and, and we at least have some sort of, of skeleton of, of what we need to do. I think what also solidified the need for communication, um, as we've mentioned before, is information is so easily accessible now. And if you do not get your information out, someone else might, and it might not be the message you want. It might not be the information you want out there. It might be false rumors. It might be false information. And it goes so fast that if you don't act, someone else might, and it might be too late after that. Consequences might, might uh, you know, kill your event, your organization, or, or whatever your crisis you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, this leads me to another question. When and if an event has um, something unexpected but dire happen, something really, um, I'll take a concert, you know, if somebody um, is trampled or something happens, like a negative outcome, but you've done all of your crisis planning for the logistics of the activity, but then something during the activity happens that causes a level of pandemonium. I can even think of uh, the Ariana Grande concert. I believe it was in London. There was a, there was a, a bomb attack, right? And then it changed things for everyone afterwards, but right. no one expected that necessarily at that point. How do you, as a comms team or a comms person, what do you do in that moment? How do you react right away to uh, mitigate fear, to kind of re regain the trust of the people? What, what's the process, that art form? You want to go first and uh, go after, go, Francois? No, you go okay. ahead. Uh, well, basically, if you're, no matter, uh, big, uh, Big organizations like where, where the Ariana Grande concert was, or I'm sure at the Bell Center, for, for example, at the Bell Center, most people who work security there in charge of security are former police officers who do. Uh, these companies hire specialists in risk management. Uh, we have people who go, we'll, we'll assess, we'll make a visit, and we'll make, assess the different risks. Once that's done, actually, it, the event almost becomes, there's a part that's automatic. Uh, Okay, you have a bomb, so you have an event that requires quick evacuation. So you go in a sequence. How do you evacuate them? What's the best way? If this is blocked, how do you get them there? That's, I don't want to sound like I, I don't have any feelings or anything. That's relatively easy. It's pretty much mechanical. On the communication side, this is where you're going to manage the emotion. In terms of communication, Dawson, uh, I was there. It's the advantage of having gray hair. I've been there for a long time. Uh, Dawson, what happened? We created an emergency line for the parents because what happened uh, when there was a shooting at Dawson, uh, everybody wants to talk to their kids. We have to remember Dawson was back in 2006, if my memory is correct. Um, so the cell phone lines, it was, they were unable because too many people were calling at once. So when we did the media press briefings and everything, we would put the number, emergency number where families could call to reach their loved ones. Those type of things, that's, that's a job. The emotional part, that's the job of the, the communication people have to do. Say, listen, it's one thing to manage the police operation. Now we have to manage because the last thing we want is to have more people flocking over here uh, to come and complicate our work. So that's the type of thing uh, you have to do. And then when you plan, you've got to plan. You always plan the next, uh, depending on the nature of the uh, event, the next 12 hours, 24 hours, uh, next 48 hours. Uh, I'm going to give you a little in about this. Uh, for six or seven years, I was on the uh, what we call the command teams in Montreal. So when you know, sometimes you see an event and you say, 
why are police not intervening? Why are they not doing anything right now? Well, having been in the command center, if I decide that we intervene as a place and it requires 50 officers, 100 officers, it's like when you start putting your hand in the thing you're stuck. So before I do this, before I commit 100 resources, I have to see what's the situation on the island. Do we have another problem somewhere else? Do we have something before I commit those resources? So that's what you got to think. Pandemic, if we had, you know, or when you have major uh, uh, situations in Montreal, let's say there were Canadians that won the Stanley Cup. As you know, that would have required massive resources. But despite the resources that are required, there are still people on the island that are going to call 911 that will require us for the domestic violence, for a fight, for a holdup. You have to plan this. So it becomes, becomes almost second nature. Right. So this is why the communication teams with a police department has to bring what I would call that that human side, that human touch, that's our job. It's such a nuanced thing. And I think this is the art part that we're learning, right? I said in the notes just now, it feels almost like a masterclass where we're getting you know, these tips because the, the general population isn't thinking how much risk management specifically and how much communication of that is being given to us. We're just learning about a concert. We're just hearing about, that's all we see. Right. And so this piece of the event planning and communications that go along with it is is, is so nuanced that um, calling it an art form is really the right thing. Right. Because you want to you want to flirt with that line. Really, you want to straddle that line properly of giving information and not inciting fear, giving information and not uh, and not wanting people to leave the event. You want to make sure that people are, you know, happy for the lack of a better term. Um, with that, Francois, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna be very quick, just probably the most important piece of advice in crisis communication. Most major crises involve very often different players or you know, from different uh, agencies or organizations. If you are the communications person for what, whatever one of these organizations, never ever speak on behalf of another organization stick in your specialty in your area. You'd be surprised how many times that happens. And oftentimes people are not in bad faith. They don't mean bad, but it'll get you into, into trouble. That's exactly what I was going to say. If we go back to your uh, example for the concert, um, you know, you probably have a big reach, right? Ariana Grande, it's a big concert. A lot of people follow her or a lot of people follow the stadium. Um, Great power, great responsibilities. If you start putting on Twitter, hey, uh, call us if you're looking for someone, you're starting to play on the police forces field, right? So like Andre said, you know, keep, keep what info you want to get out, what you need to get out, but let the professionals do their work, get their message out there, right? You don't want to create uh, interference in the messages as well. So stick to what you know, stick with you, what your sandbox and let the others deal with their sandbox. In mm -hmm. this case, the police forces, for example. Right, thank you. And um, I see that we're close to wrapping. So I wanted to ask Lucia, did you also wanna um, say something about that question? If not, we could always give you some more questions. <laughs> no, it's okay. I think uh, both uh, François and Andre did a great job in, uh, in answering that one. Um, before we do wrap, I'm going to pass it back to Dina, but I, I did want to comment on something you said, Lucia, which is never before have people started to really get the spotlight on the importance of the roles that we have, right? So I don't think prior to the pandemic, anybody really looked at healthcare the way they did, right? Like really, truly examined the need, the responsibility, the pressures of the healthcare system. The same thing with teachers when everyone started to homeschool their children for various months at a time. Same thing with communications and yourselves, right? Like the, the need for the messaging to come from the organization is so important. Um, Dina opened up talking about everything that's also been spotlighted within the past 18 months, everything from, you know, various movements, injustices, so on and so forth. So we're seeing such a need for everything to be nuanced really is the word I can use in comms and my final question before I, I want to or my final comment rather before throwing it back to Dina is 
um, the art form by which you are providing information is so required and so necessary, specifically through a time like this, that um, do you feel that more people or more organizations will start to put proper energies into getting communication teams going? I think organizations need to be aware of it. Unfortunately, it's not until they need it that they, they realize. I realized that in my uh, consulting business that people for years have been going on without a plan. And then at the last minute, if you, if you, are, if you have a plan and you're aware of the importance of uh, the communication in hard times, everything should be fixed. Any major organization who employs people should have a plan in place, what I mentioned beforehand, the four or five situations. And they've got about 99% of their situations covered. You know, most of us take life insurance. I remember, I, I know that when planning for stuff, some people will say, well, why do you make all these plans? It's not gonna happen. I say, do you have life insurance? They said, yeah, well, you're planning to die tomorrow? Oh no, but just in case, well, it's the same thing. Just in right. case, be prepared. Thank you. Lucia? Uh, couldn't agree more with Andre and, and sometimes um, it's the same thing. So within that crisis communication plan, sometimes translation falls into the back burner or it's an afterthought. And then uh, from terrible situations that I've seen where uh, a message was interpreted a, a different way that it was intended to in crisis situation, that's where uh, organizations uh, just turn to translators to, to really hone in that perfect message. Oh, like we, we touched on, just keeping it as clear and simple as possible, uh, but it is important to, to include it as part of, of your plan. And like you said, the, it is truly an art form to be able to balance our, all, all of those variables and all, all of the stakeholders and just making sure that we keep it simple. Um, but again, it is an art form. It is. Thank you. François-Olivier. Um, can't agree more with what Lucia, Lucia and André said. Um, you know, I think it's about knowing what you you what your your organization needs to put out there let the others one do it uh keep it simple yeah perfect thank you i'll pass it back to dina i wanted to thank you all go ahead dina talk to you nope oh you're muted oops Sorry, I think François Olivier really uh, uh, summarized it, uh, and I mean, and Lucia did it, and André, it's, it's all the same message, keep it simple. I think that's what it is in terms of uh, crisis communications, and uh, yeah, it is art, and uh, you know, I, I think it's a very important job that uh, crisis communicators do. Clearly, it's um, it ensures, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's a difference between life and death, so... Um, it's very important and I really appreciate uh, the three of you taking your time, sharing your expertise, sharing your advice uh, with us. So thank you so much. It's, um, it's been really a pleasure. It's been an hour and a half and it went by so fast. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking forward to having our next panel, maybe in a couple of months and uh, see how things evolve because, uh, you know, we see that Things evolve so quickly, you know, uh, in, especially in communications uh, field with the social media and all the tools and everything. So it would be interesting to see how it affects uh, crisis communications in a couple of years. So thank you again so much. Uh, uh, very much appreciated and uh, a pleasure to have uh, spent this hour and a half with the three of you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.